Hello and thanks for joining us for another edition of Northwest Newsweek. I'm Mitchell Ringos. Well, more details are coming to light about a fatal plane crash north of Nikina. The Cessna 208 operated by Zamair Services disappeared February 28th with two crew members on board. The pilot on the search plane that spotted the wreckage last Saturday says they had mixed emotions, knowing they had solved the mystery, but also realizing there were no survivors. Jonathan Wilson reports. The missing plane, owned by Zam Air, formerly known as Nikina Air Services, was bringing cargo to Yebatung First Nation on February 28th when it failed to arrive at the airport at Fort Hope. After a five-day search by more than half a dozen aircraft and search teams, the crew on this civil air search and rescue plane spotted a darker area in the forest below at about 11.30 last Saturday morning. We were simply flying up the track and uh, suddenly uh, we heard from one of the other members of the crew to turn hard right. Uh, we broke the aircraft hard right, came around. Uh, we lost it immediately and then uh, after a couple more turns we were able to locate the search object, uh, mark, mark it and then uh, relay the coordinates to our other SAR partners who were on scene literally in a matter of a few minutes. Did you see a, a wing? What was sticking out? The whole plane or maybe just a wing? What did you see? Uh, not very much. A little bit of scorched ground and that, that was about it. The plane crashed approximately one-third of the way along its flight to Fort Hope, just south of Chaucer Lake, about 60 kilometres north of Nikina. Major Emmanuel Graton, an Air Task Force commander involved in the search, says their Griffin helicopter couldn't land near the crash site, so a hoist was used to lower crew members to the ground. So we inserted the two uh, search and rescue technicians and unfortunately when they arrived on scene uh, both uh, occupants were found uh, without vital signs. And when we come upon a crash scene and, and there are no survivors it's, it's not good. We're, we're glad maybe we can bring closure to the family but at the same time uh, it, it's tough. It's tough for everybody. Gretton says the families of the two pilots were notified soon afterwards. The identities have not been released, but sources say the two young men were both from the Thunder Bay area. The rescue effort was hampered by the densely forested terrain, the large search area, and the lack of an emergency transmitter signal from the plane. The search involved two Hercules aircraft, helicopters from the Air Force, Coast Guard, OPP and MNR, and two civilian search planes operated by Casera. Members from Edmonton First Nation also helped search for the crash site using snowmobiles. I really appreciate everyone's efforts. It, it was uh, definitely a big team that uh, coordinated this event and uh, we're really happy with all the support we received from the local uh, community and the, all the different uh, resources. The OPP were in charge of transporting the victims from the crash site to a forensic lab for post-mortems. The Transportation Safety Board sent investigators to the scene to try to determine the cause. Jonathan Wilson, TBT News. Kenora OPP are confirming that a collision on Highway 17 has led to one fatality. A transport truck collided with a passenger car on Wednesday evening about halfway between Kenora and Vermilion Bay. The driver of the car, a 69-year-old Kenora resident, was pronounced dead at the scene, while the transport driver suffered minor injuries. The highway there was shut down for around eight hours. Meanwhile, another section of Highway 17 was closed for several hours earlier on Wednesday due to a house fire. The fire broke out at a home in Denorwick near the turn off to Sioux Lookout. Members of the Dryden OPP responded just after 12 noon along with fire and emergency medical services. Thick smoke was pouring out of the house and the highway was closed while first responders dealt with the blaze. OPP say there were no injuries reported as a result of the fire. They add that the blaze is not suspicious in nature and no charges were laid as a result of the occurrence. The chief of Neskantica First Nation says he and his members are willing to lay down their lives in order to stop the development of mining roads into the Ring of Fire. The strong message from Chief Wayne Munius came after the Ford government approved the terms of reference for the proposed Northern Road link. We will fight and we, will, we are determined to protect our, our way of life, our rights. And uh, this is a message to all the investors if you want to come and do business in our, in our traditional homelands, you have to get the free prior for consent of our people. That is it. On Monday, Mining Minister George Peary was joined by Webequay Chief Cornelius Wabas and Martin Falls Chief Bruce Ashney Panescom for the Roadlink announcement. The two communities are leading the environmental assessment for the new corridor, which would connect the proposed Martin Falls Access Road and Webequay Supply Road to future mines. Ms. Kantika has been a vocal opponent to developing the Ring of Fire,
And Munia says the road and the mines will have a negative impact on Attawapiskat River, which he called the lifeblood of his community. This is unacceptable. This is something that's very concerning for us. And that's something that uh, the seal of Ring of Fire Medals needs to know you that you're not going to cross our river system without our free prior informed consent. You're going to have to kill us. You're going to have to do more than just getting access from the province of Ontario. Ring of Fire Medals CEO Kristen Straub responded saying, quote, This Kantika First Nation is an important community to us, and we continue to extend an invitation to Chief Munius. We are committed to listening to the views and aspirations of all communities and to making balanced decisions about future development in the Ring of Fire. The strong words from Chief Munius were echoed at Queen's Park on Thursday. Kiwetanung MPP Saul Mamakwa says the Ford government is using classic colonial tactics in trying to divide and conquer Northern First Nations, and he called on the Premier to respect Munius's message. He said a couple of days ago, you're not going to cross the river system without our free prior, prior informed consent. You're going to have to kill us. Those are his words. To the Premier, what is the government doing to uphold the law, follow its Treaty 9 obligation, and obtain consent of all First Nations impacted by the Northern Road Link? The Corridor to Prosperity is an opportunity for all Indigenous communities in that area to unleash new health, social and economic benefits, bring in better forms of energy, stronger broadband, better critical infrastructure, Mr. Speaker. This is a massive northern development opportunity. We'll build consensus with those communities, Mr. Spons. Speaker, and we'll look forward to an opportunity to build a critical mineral mine the world class uh, of a world-class scale. Thank you. OPP patrol vehicles throughout the Northwest region are now equipped with an automated license plate recognition system and in-car cameras. The new system makes it faster and easier for the provincial police to run license plate information. Carl Langdon spoke with the detachment commander in Nipigon and the technology and files this report. The OPP's new automated license plate recognition system is faster and cheaper than the old technology, making it possible for the police force to install the cameras in all patrol vehicles and to automatically flag license plates linked with criminal or traffic offences. Well, on average, uh, to do a traffic stop, to talk to the driver, to get a license, uh, to go back to the car, to get that information to his dispatcher, it could take 15, 15 minutes, 10 minutes. Um, this system here will run multiple plates in fractions of a second. Nipigon Detachment Commander David Moskal explains that the system can scan plates and look them up in an MTO database, alerting officers as they drive if a license plate is associated with one of a number of offences. So for example, it will tell us if there's an amber alert attached to that plate. It'll tell us if that plate is stolen. It'll tell us whether the registered owner may be a suspended driver or prohibited driver. According to Moskal, there is nothing new about the capacity to scan plates, but the old system was cost prohibitive and was only installed on one of the detachment's vehicles. With cameras mounted on the roof, winter visibility could also be affected by snow and salt. We always have a reason for stopping a vehicle, and this system will give us an alert which will give us a reason to stop a vehicle. We just don't randomly stop vehicles. We have, we have a, a reason, whether that be a traffic infraction, whether the officer recognizes uh, that perhaps that driver is suspended or prohibited. The new cameras can also act as dash cams, automatically recording video when a vehicle's lights are activated or it exceeds 150 kilometers per hour. There is also a secondary camera in each vehicle that officers can activate to record the rear seats. Footage Moscow says will be disclosable to anyone facing charges. Carl Langdon, TVT News. Suspended Grand Chief Derek Fox attended an emergency meeting on the NAND Chiefs in Toronto on Thursday, but Fox says he was never given the chance to speak or defend himself against allegations which he says have still not been disclosed to him. Fox was suspended by the NAND Executive Council on February 27th for alleged violations of the Code of Conduct. Fox responded a few days later saying he's been wrongfully and possibly defamed by statements that are untrue. NAN officials would not respond to requests for comment about the meeting or even confirm that it was taking place. 
The Globe and Mail posted this photo showing Fox putting on his chief's headdress before entering the emergency meeting where he defiantly insisted he is still the Grand Chief. Fox says he was promised a chance to address the Chiefs and tell his side of the story, but instead he was asked to leave the room and wait outside. Fox says he was later informed that his suspension was reaffirmed with no word on what the next steps will be. We'll have more on Derek Fox and his lawsuit against the Chief of Onigamink First Nation right after this short break. Welcome back. Suspended Nan Grand Chief Derek Fox has brought forward a $200,000 lawsuit against Onigaming First Nation Chief Jeffrey Kopanis. Fox is alleging Kopanis made defamatory remarks against him during a special chief's assembly in December. According to the statement of claim, Kopanis re referenced allegations that Fox used the physically abused a Treaty 3 female chief, and he also mentioned another woman asking Fox to stop harassing her via text. Fox is categorically denying the allegations, which he says will cause him to suffer continued damage to his reputation. The lawsuit was filed in mid-January, five weeks before Nan suspended Fox while an internal investigation is conducted into alleged code of conduct violations. Fox issued a statement last week saying he has been wrongfully and possibly defamed by statements that are untrue. Kenora Mayor Andrew Poirier says he's pleased to see the impact of a 15% discount to OPP policing costs on their 2023 budget. The discount had been only 5% and Kenora and other communities have been lobbying for more. But Poirier sees the increased discount as only a temporary solution and he's advocating for ongoing policing support. Kenora City Council has long made requests to the province to provide discounts to their OPP services. The success of this year's request has resulted in a rebate amounting over half a million dollars, which lowered the municipal tax hike from over 7% to about 5.3%. In spite of the reduced cost, Poirier believes the process of repeatedly negotiating for temporary relief packages requires too great of an investment of time by the municipality as well as the province and ultimately leaves the city having to prepare next year's budget before funding is solidified. That's what I would like to see in that. Then we know we have some predictability about what our policing costs are because 
again, we, you know, if our policing costs were $2 million less than they are today, um, that money could do a variety of things. Poirier emphasizes that Kenora needs a permanent or long-term solution going forward. The city of Dryden is getting a new hotel under the Microtel banner, a subsidiary of Wyndham Hotels. Council is currently considering a site plan for a 76-room Microtel Moda Hotel. Dryden has a shortage of hotel spaces according to a business gap analysis. And Mayor Jack Harrison says he's excited by the development. There will be some uh, long-term suites there like for a month. So we found that there's a good contractor base that comes into our city. So it'll be helpful for that. Plus, we do have a lot of uh, tournaments in our arena, so we've, that's a, been a shortage there to, to house uh, folks during our tournament, so that'll be uh, fill that need. So yeah, so that'll really add to our complement. You know, on the highway, we do have a lot of tourists coming through as well, which uh, fills up our hotels pretty quickly. So I think this will be great for our businesses uh, to have more people they'd be able to stay in our town overnight. The proposed site for the new hotel is right on Government Street, the highway running through Dryden. It's too soon to say when construction might begin, but if everything goes smoothly and council approves the site plan, it could take as little as a month to process a building permit. Within the year, there could be a commercial port up and running on the North Shore. Red Rock Indian Band was si has signed an MOU with the BMI Group and Red Rock Mill Development to support the revitalization of the pier at the former mill site on Nipigon Bay. Lee Noonan has the story. Refurbishing the old pier at the former liner board mill site in the township of Red Rock could take as little as six months or as long as a year, according to Marcus Hardy, chief of Red Rock Indian Band. He says the First Nation has deep ties to the 360-acre property now owned by BMI Group subsidiary Red Rock Mill Development. It's our traditional territory, so we want to be able to make sure that work is being done in, in a good way and meaningful manner where the environment's protected, the water's protected. The port was last operational in the 1970s. A BMI Group spokesperson says the first phase of the project, refurbishing the old pier and cleaning out some of the old mill infrastructure, could cost between $15 and $25 million. River's Edge Development CEO Justice Feldman, now a managing partner at BMI Group, had announced plans to reopen the port back in 2015. Although those plans were not realized, his brother, Paul Veldman, was on site to confirm the most recent plans with Hardy, who is confident that this time the project will move ahead. I believe right now, uh, with, the, with the mining boom, with uh, the, the inevitable uh, economic boom happening in our area, uh, the stars have aligned. Some work has already begun with a rough road to the pier already cleared and new power lines being installed now. Hardy sees the port bringing a number of benefits to his community and the whole region. You know what, it's going to save money, time, it's going to also save lives. Uh, you know, we're taking more trucks off the Highway 1117. It seems every, every week there's new accidents happening. Uh, there's always fatalities on the highway. By opening up these shipping lanes and doing everything by barge or by, by big ship, uh, you know, we're going to uh, minimize the risk of uh, transport fatalities, transport accidents, and take emissions off the land. The expectation is that supplies and machinery will be shipped up the Great Lakes to Red Rock, destined for communities and mines to the north, while aggregate and possibly lumber will be shipped back down. The BMI groups say they've already purchased a barge, which will be used to ship through the port of Thunder Bay until the port is open in Red Rock. Lee Noonan, TBT News. We'll be back in just a moment with a story about the Ukrainian refugees who are now working at the Resolute Sawmill in Sapau.
Welcome back. Resolute Forest Products has hired dozens of Ukrainians to work at their sawmill near Atakokin. The hirings have not only helped the refugees settle into Canada after fleeing the Russian invasion, but it's allowed the sawmill to thrive as well. Lee Newton was at the mill in Sapawi this week. She files this report. There are about 30 Ukrainian refugees now working at the Resolute Mill in Sapawi near Atakokin. Mill manager Greg Kroniski says the massive effort to bring the Ukrainian workers to Sapawi was well worth it. It's the difference between running and not running for us. Uh, so when you add up the dollars and cents at the end of the day, uh, from a business perspective, it was the right decision. From a moral perspective, it was the right decision. From a community perspective, it was the right decision. Kroniski says the people of Atacokin came together to support the workers and that the whole community stands to benefit. Oleksandr Bakal and Oleksandr Vasilenko both say they feel supported by the company and welcome in the community. After work on the weekend, they, they give us a lot of support and a lot of different stuff. And I want to say thank you for them. I want to say thank you for people who are living here in Atikokan. Bakal says he's learning a lot and enjoying the work. Vasilenko also says he has fun with his job in quality control. He arrived in August and headed straight to work at the sawmill, although not before stopping in at Fort William First Nation to share in a meal. So I came there and they uh, cooked uh, moose curry. I think it's some kind of soup with <laughs> moose meat and they uh, give me a try. <laughs> Unlike Bakal and Vasilenko, many of their compatriots speak little or no English. HR Superintendent Scott Manford says the language barrier was one of the biggest hurdles to overcome but that despite that, the Ukrainian workers fit in right away. Uh, you expect uh, a lot of hurdles and, and problems with, you know, different nationality, different lifestyle, different philosophies. And when they showed up here, they, they welcomed us with open arms as we did them. Manfred says recruiting Ukrainians has become easier as the workers have been spreading the word and recommending that friends and family come to Atacokan. The pain of being separated from loved ones and seeing the devastation back at home is a problem without a solution, says Bakal. You know, we become more than just a team of work. We live together, we learn a new world together, you know, we discover this beautiful country and these people here together all. Four more workers are arriving from the Ukraine within the next couple of months. And while the mill does prioritize hiring locally, they hope to continue filling any vacant positions with more Ukrainian workers. Lee Noonan, TBT News. The begins annual ice climbing event celebrated its 37th consecutive year last weekend. Ice Fest is an entirely volunteer-run event welcoming members of the public who wanted to try it out. And the weather conditions were nearly perfect for the intermediate-level clinic. Carl Langdon has the story. Nipigan's annual Ice Fest was back for another exciting year of mixed climbing activities, with their group of dedicated volunteers offering live demonstrations on several of the region's world-class ice faces. With ice climbing seeing a recent surge of interest in the Great Lakes region, and Nipigan's Ice Fest holding the title of Canada's longest running event of its kind, organizers were well prepared to welcome the public back for their 37th edition. The president of the event, Eric Fishman, with outdoor thrills and skills, and other expert guides were on site to offer advice and supervision, which Fishman says is essential to make the event enjoyable for climbers of all skill levels. Actually, the Nipigan Ice Fest has always been run by volunteers. And we have a bunch of uh, instructors that come and help uh, pretty much facilitate and run the event. So these are all experienced climbers who are just excited to help get people out. And that's pretty much, uh, pretty much what they're here to do is just like get people climbing, expose them to different styles and uh, just have a good time outside. The Nipigon area's unique geography allows for opportunities unseen in other parts of the province, with this region quickly becoming one of North America's premier destinations for ice climbing. Fishman says there are over 100 faces along highways 11 and 17, which has contributed to the spike in popularity. Northwest Ontario, this region, Thunder Bay, north of Nipigon area is where we're at. It's loaded with all this kind of, this fun stuff. We could do every kind of climbing here from every difficulty level, from really easy to near impossible. Fishman would like to encourage anyone who's in the region next year to come out to the local annual ice climbing event and for any experienced climbers to reach out to help run next year's ice fest. Carl Langdon, TBT News.
Well, I think I'll leave the ice climbing to the professionals, but thank you for joining us for another edition of Northwest Newsweek. We'll see you next week.